We are continuing in our Lenten series this morning where we're looking at how doubt brings about action. Our background passage is still Mark chapter 1, verse 9 through 15, and then the, the, the supplemental where the point kind of rallies around is found in Mark chapter 9, verses 14 to 24. Let's begin at uh, Mark 1. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth to Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness for forty days, tempted by the Satan. And he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited upon him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God, and saying, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God has come, repent and believe in the good news. This happened at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. Now let's, let's jump two and a half years into the future, shall we? When they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and some scribes arguing with them. When the whole cross crowd saw him, they were immediately overcome with awe, and they ran forward to greet him. He asked them, what are you arguing about with them? Someone from the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought you my son. He has a spirit that makes him unable to speak, and whenever it seizes him, it dashes him down. And he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. And I asked your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. He answered them, you faithless generation. How much longer must I be among you? How much longer must I put up with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. When the spirit saw him immediately, it threw the boy into convulsions, and he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the father, father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. It has often cast him into the fire and into water to destroy him. But if you are able to do anything, have pity on us and help us. Jesus said to him, if you are able... All things can be done for one who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out, I believe! Help my unbelief. May God a blessing on the reading of his word this morning. Would you all pray with me, please? Amazing God in this hour in this place, I ask that you grant to me the gift of preaching. That the meditation of my heart, the words of my mouth, bring glory to you, O God, my rock and my redeemer. And to your beloved who are gathered here today, I ask that you grant to them the gift of hearing. In our time of meditation on your word, may we grow closer to you and to each other as we continue in this Lenten season. In Jesus' name, amen. We are in the fourth week of Lent. As a church, we take these times, six weeks in total, to prepare to receive the power of the resurrection, a point, of self, you know, a point that we need to celebrate, the resurrection. Because if you stop and you think about it, without the resurrection, there would be no need to call ourselves Christians. Because in that moment, God showed his power over death. Yes, Jesus was born. Yes, Jesus died. But of all the biblical heroes that are mentioned in the Bible, Jesus is the only one who was resurrected from the tomb. Without the resurrection, there would be no reason to call ourselves Christians. 
In Lent, we are intentionally taking time of following the steps that Jesus took in his journey. From his time in the wilderness, we are walking with him. And we're looking at how it prepared him for his ministry with a hope that it will help us to grow in our resolve to serve and share the kingdom of God with all whom we encounter. Lent, then, is a time to work on our relationship with God, where our surrender to his power brings us a resolve to serve, where we receive clarity when we are faced with temptation, when we gain strength by acknowledging that we do not have the power to do these things on our own. We need to be dependent upon a God who does, who will fill us, guide us, and love us through these circumstances. But when it comes to growing in our relationship with God, we seem to experience times of doubt. We have doubt in our faith. We have doubt in our understanding. We have doubt in what God is telling us, leading us through, and providing for us. We doubt if God will make good on his promise. When it comes to doubt that God will make good on his promise or to empower and equip for us to face the challenges of life, sometimes we will face those challenges of doubt and we may not be in a wilderness experience. We will not be in a place where it is easy to see that we are in a place that is deserted and it seems like our enemies are all around us. Sometimes we can feel totally and completely alone and on our own, but it can happen in a split second, and then all of a sudden we have this sense of community. Doubt can come in the blink of an eye or in a long dry spell. But whether it is fast or slow, we still will doubt. In the wilderness time, just with everything we know, believe, and trust and feel, it calls into question, yep, doubt arises, but... When it is about our faith, well, then that's very, very hard to handle sometimes. When God's not there the way that we think God should be. This is when we will tend to complain. This will be the time when we tend to get frustrated that it's not moving fast enough. This will be the time in which we'll say, nope, I don't want to wait any longer, and we walk away from God and the situation. What we forget, though, is doubt is an essential part of our Christian journey. It is an essential part of our Christian journey. When we are in the wilderness, our cry is often the same as the Father recorded here in Mark. I believe in you, God. Help my unbelief. How often do we stop and make a repentant confession of what, we un- of what we don't get, what we don't understand, what frustrates the bajitas out of us? How often do we do that? How often do we stop and say, God, I don't got it. I need you. Sure, we might do it when we're hurting, we're in a rush, but when we are overwhelmed, and instead of making a rash decision, we turn to God. How often... Do we do that? Lent is a perfect time for us to visit our doubts and to echo the utter cry of that dad worrying about his son having him get better. God, I believe, but I just don't get it. Help me. Give me clarity. Give me peace. Help me in whatever way I need help. In the second reading, the father is seeking healing for his son. Now, this is not the first and last cry of a person of faith who is struggling in the scriptures or in the recording of time. People down through the ages, including some of our greatest Christian leaders and Bible heroes, have experienced doubt in their own personal wilderness times. And it saddens me greatly sometimes how we in the church have often dismissed or discounted a person's doubts as products of an immature or undeveloped faith. That conclusion is all too easy to cast. 
What doubt can serve as is, is an honest projection for us to celebrate our level of complete brokenness of believing and understanding of the Almighty God. Any one of us gathered here today on this Sunday morning harbors some type of doubt of something in our hearts. Points and tidbits and anxieties which vacillate between faith, knowing that what God will do, and doubt, wondering what God can do. Whether we know it or not, we live and worship in a world that hungers for resolution and understanding. And this is why it is critically important that the church be a safe place, an inviting place, an open place where these doubts can be raised without, quest- without the questioner being made to feel like a second-class citizen or a Christian who don't know nothing. We don't want the people to feel like they belong in their brokenness. Not that they have the standard of perfection that they must live up to and emulate. Who here among us gathered today does not have some honest doubts and doesn't struggle with our own brokenness? Doubt is a natural part of the Christian journey. It is an essential element to growing our faith. Most of the Christians will experience doubt at one time or another. I know I have on a regular basis. Just when I think things are going great, something happens that shakes my foundation. Now, for me personally, in the last year, my wife's health has given me several moments of doubt. My son, growing from needing his daddy to needing his dad. Everyone whose parents understand what I'm saying? They don't need me to take care of every little thing. They want to have some of their independence, and I have to let them make, he have to let them make his mistakes. Boy, talk about moments of doubt. When my house flooded, and oh, I can have this back together in three months. And yesterday was the first day in about eight that I had two hours to hang about 36 linear feet of drywall. (laughs) When will it get done? When will it end? When will life slow down to a dull, dull roar? Come on, God, what am I missing here? Doubt, 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 doubt. I know I experience it often. Sometimes, as I said before, it goes for long periods of time and we wonder if it will ever end, while other moments are just fleeting moments and we will experience them a number of times throughout their lives, while there are others who seem like never doubt for anything. It doesn't matter. We're all having moments of doubt. The simple reason is that in the wilderness, the wilderness is not a destination. It is not a place for us to stop and stay there for the rest of our lives. In these times of doubt, it forces us to stop and put forth a call of action. And how we react is pretty important. We're either going to open ourselves up and depend on God, or we're going to fight it with every breath not acknowledging God, Or we will sit there and merely resign to the fact that, nope, I can't do anything, and we just sit there and wait for the end to come. Here's my question. Who wants to live a life in a perpetual wilderness fashion? Who wants to make their home in the wilderness and situation and say, this will be my normal, suffering and pain? Any healthy person that I know, the answer to that is no. But for those that they've lived a life that this is all they've known, stepping out of that wilderness environment and being able to open themselves up to the peace, serenity, the power, the wonder of God is equally as frightening as those who enter the wilderness. So let me clarify something, because I've thrown a lot of stuff out there. There is a huge difference between doubting and giving up. To doubt is to be uncertain or lack any confidence in someone or something. 
To give up is to stop. To quit trying, to surrender all hope, to to relinquish our energies and abandon any form of faith because we believe that no matter what we do, we are ultimately and utterly defeated. There is a difference between wrestling in our faith and casting it aside because it is too hard to hear, too hard to trust, too hard to follow. There is a big difference between moving through doubt and getting stuck there and becoming a cynic. That is a person who is motivated only by their own selfishness, their own personal desires, and nothing else. In other words, if they can't see what they can gain out of it, they ain't putting no time into it. As I have stated earlier, the healthy way of understanding doubt is to understand it as part of our faith journey. Not an interruption, not a hindrance, but an essential, necessary, fundamental part of it. The key to doubt in being on the journey versus working towards a destination is revealed right here in Mark chapter 9, where the father is moving towards God. He has doubt that his boy can ever be healed. In other words, be normal. In other words, be accepted by the people in his family, his village, his culture, even the world. Because someone with an affliction like this would live a life as a destitute beggar. No one would hire them. No one will marry him. No one will take care of him. At some point in time, when the bonds of parental responsibility are broken, he is on his own. His dad wants his boy to be able to go forward and have a happy, healthy life. He's, his call to action in his doubt is moving him towards God by appealing to the Son, Jesus the Christ, our Messiah. He, he moves towards a deeper understanding of himself and what he brings in the journey of faith. For he believes, but he recognizes that he has weaknesses within that belief. He has doubts. <coughs> I believe, help me in my unbelief. He is willing to identify and wrestle with his doubts to receive the power of God's revelatory grace. In this case specifically, the healing of his son. Now, the good news for us in all of this is that the doubt we experience experience is actually beneficial because the doubt stimulates us and spurs us towards growing in our own faith. In his book, Wishful Thinking, one of my favorite writers, Frederick Buechner, states, If you don't have any doubts, you are kidding yourself or simply asleep. For doubts is the ants in the pants of faith. They keep faith moving. They keep faith awake. And what I find incredibly interesting is that God's most faithful servants, our spiritual heroes that we find in the Bible, have usually been among us the most doubtful. Peter, the rock, refused to believe. He doubted that Jesus would suffer and die on the cross. He wouldn't hear of it. Thomas, known as the doubter, wouldn't believe that Jesus was resurrected until he saw the hands and the side and actually touched it to realize that this was the risen Messiah. Paul was a doubting persecutor and had to be knocked off his animal and struck blind and healed before he could believe in something greater than the teachings of his rabbinical background. We tend to think that doubt is the opposite of faith, but in reality, the opposite of faith is apathy or a staunch refusal to dis a strong refusal of disbelief that that is the true opposite of faith. Refusing to take the step. The existential philosopher and theologian Paul Tillich defined faith as the state of being ultimately concerned. In other words, we are most concerned about what we really have faith in. It's what permeates our minds a majority of the time. It's what we work towards each and every day. 
It's what we say we hold most dear above anyone and anything else. Is that our faith in God? We are called to be ultimately concerned with God, to have faith and trust in God. The opposite of being ultimately concerned is not caring at all. But if I am ultimately concerned about God and my life in God, then my doubt will not destroy my faith. But it will deepen my concern and spurn me into a journey of resolution. And it was the journey of resolution that carried Jesus out of the wilderness to begin his ministry. It took him through the days and the confrontations and the teachings and the healings and the miraculous things he did. It brought salvation to the world. It took him to the cross and it resurrected him. Doubt brings action. And as a result of that action, it is, our, it is our ability to grow stronger in our relationship with God and our ability then to share our faith with others. Because when is the most opportune moment to quietly, lovingly share faith with someone? When they're struggling, when they're in doubt. And we can give testimony, story of, well, I haven't been in your situation but I know God has carried me through mine, and that is available for you too. If we look at the lives of those we consider to be the most faith-filled down through the ages, it would be difficult to conclude that doubt is a destructive element and something to be avoided. Some of the people who have been most influential in my Christian journey in my lifetime outside of the scriptures have people that I have watched through face incredible difficult challenges and their faith has gotten them through. One of them was a man named Dale Pigeon. Dale Pigeon stood about this tall and the older he got, the more I think God's sense of humor kicked in because the more his face looked like that of a pigeon. Oh, he laughed about it. He thought it was wonderful. In the last few years of Dale's life, he spent a lot of it in the hospital. And the last bout that he was in for was oral cancer. It was beginning to get into his lower mandibular joint, his, his, the joint in the jawline. And because of this very frightening news, and this is about 25, years, 20, oh, 25, 30 years ago now, um, the advances of treating cancer were not as strong as they are today. So the doctor dropped the bomb, gave him the bad news, and then left, which a lot of physicians do. The chaplains weren't available, so he called up a social worker to kind of sit there and process him out. And as the story goes, according to his beloved wife, Lorna, the social worker said, so how are you going to get through this, Dale? Are you worried? And Dale said, well, I don't like it. And I'm kind of curious how the treatment options are going to be. But other than that, I'm not overly worried. And the social worker said, why? And he said, my faith will get me through. I've doubted enough. I've struggled enough. And I've come to realize that even in this sick state, even if God calls me home because of this condition, I'll be in a far better state than I am right now something that would cripple and terrify us, he turned into a moment of beautiful witnessing testimony, whether he intended to or not. God was at the forefront of his mind. Perhaps the struggle that we have in doubt is essential to a strong, mature faith. In the same way that struggle is essential for a butterfly to emerge from a cocoon after it's been a caterpillar and going through its metamorphosis. If it doesn't emerge from the cocoon, it can't grow and have the strength of a new creature. So if doubt is part of our Christian journey, what should we do when it appears? I have three things that if you want to write down and take away, be my guest. 
First of all, when doubt approaches, do not suppress it. Our authentic faith begins with genuine honesty of mind, body, and spirit. Doubt is the foundation of that honesty. Ask questions. Continue to search. Call out. Cry out. Do not let your doubts stop up the channels towards God and the channels of God towards you. Instead, let the doubt open the channels in new ways with new insights and understanding. Pray to our God, Lord, I believe. Help me in my unbelief. Second, I would encourage you to stay involved with other mature Christians who will challenge and grow your faith. They will ask you critical questions that you may not want to be asked. They will make you squirm and show you how you are getting in the way of your own spiritual growth. We can learn a lesson here from the disciple Thomas who voiced his serious doubts and yet continued to remain in the company with the other disciples as he worked through those doubts. He didn't pick up his toys and go home. He stuck with it, recognizing that what he was part of was greater than who he was. Group support and group sharing is a powerful way that we can share our burdens and find support from moving through periods of doubt to periods of glory. Lastly, continue to seek Jesus and the faith that we have in him. The issue for us then is never, therefore, one to avoid the doubts as if there is a cure for them. Rather, it is continuing, moving onward in an honest relationship towards and with the God who created us, calls us, saves us, and will sustain us. The prophet Jeremiah said, when you search me, you will find me. Jesus said, Ask, and it will be given. Search, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. Nowhere do the scriptures say, when you have doubt, just sit and stew, and it'll go away. When you have doubts, do something about it. Call on your God. Let him carry you through. When we do all these things, in our periods of doubts and questions... We are led to action of our hearts, action of our soul, action of our minds, actions of our bodies, and we grow and serve people, both in and outside of our walls, as the people of God we are called and meant to be, of action out of our doubts, acknowledging our brokenness, and revealing how in all of that, Jesus, our Savior, makes us whole. Would you pray with me, please? Loving God when we don't know. When we have an academic understanding that you are there, but we lack the personal interaction, what that feels like, what that looks like, what that should be like, help us in our weakness of unbelief. Help us to recognize that you are not merely the one who created the heavens and the earth, but you are also active within that creation in our lives each and every day. And you don't want us to just merely carry the burdens on our own shoulders. You want us to cry out to you, to engage those whom you send to be in our presence amongst us, to help us, to guide us, to heal us, to allow us to be the witnesses we are called and enabled to be. Help us, O God, to not run away from our times of doubts. Help us not to sit there and give up. Help us not to care. Instead, help us move towards you as you are moving towards us. We celebrate all of this in your son's beautiful name. Amen. So getting through this thing through life can be a real challenge. It can be kind of difficult, overwhelming. And really give us pause in saying, hey, this thing called walking with God 
is really supposed to be an element that, hey, makes me feel good. Doesn't take me through this stuff. But as I read the scriptures from cover to cover, that's not the message that's being spoken. That's not the reality that's being revealed. It is saying there, were, there are going to be challenges. You're going to have dry spells. You're going to have productive spells. You're going to have droughts. You're going to have plenty. And you're going to have everything in between. And guess what? God's going to be there in all of it. Especially when we're uncertain. Especially when our belief and our faith is not put into question, but thrown into question. Because we don't kind of ease into a place of panic and doubt. It gets dropped on us like a ton of bricks. And God will be right there, moving towards you. Just leave the channels open so that you can move towards God and not do anything you'll regret or question. When my boy was really little in elementary school, it was make sure you put yourself in a position where you can always make a good decision. God's offering that to each and every one of us in every moment of doubt, wonder, and question. As you all go from this place, think about what you've heard. Think about what you've felt. Think about what you've experienced it. Think about it. Wrestle with it. If the Spirit calls you to, apply some of it to your lives. But as you all go from this place, do not be afraid to let the world know that you all are people of God. That means he's with you. He's surrounding you. He's guiding you. And he's always moving towards you. Go in grace. Be filled with his peace. Have a great week, everybody. Amen.